Hi students, welcome to the chapter 15 lecture. In this lecture, I'm going to be covering the evolution of microbial life. In the previous two chapters, I've covered how populations evolve, so microevolution, and I've also covered how biological diversity evolves, which is another way of saying macroevolution. But you may be wondering, how did life first arise on Earth? Well, to gain insight into this um, line of inquiry, scientists have synthesized from scratch the entire genome, so the complete DNA sequence of a small bacterium known as Mycoplasma mycoides, and they have transplanted that artificial genome into the cells of a closely related species called Mycoplasma capricolum. So notice here we have two bacteria that are in the same genus. They share the genus name Mycoplasma, but the species name is different. The newly installed genome took over the recipient cells, and it began manufacturing its own proteins. So despite the fact that it was transplanted into an M. capricolum bacterial cell, it began manufacturing the proteins that were specified in that M. mycoides genome. And it also reproduced to make more cells containing the synthetic M. mycoides genome. This is a link here to an article about this um, experiment. So if you'd like to read more about it, you can um, click on this link here. Okay, so I'm going to be covering some major episodes in the history of life. Our best estimate for the age of the Earth is 4.6 billion years, and prokaryotes, which are simple cells that lack a true nucleus and organelles, were the first type of cell to evolve. They evolved by about 3.5 billion years ago. They began oxygen production about 2.7 billion years ago. They lived alone, so in the absence of any more advanced cell types for more than a billion years, and they continue in great abundance today. Single-celled eukaryotes, which are the cells with a true nucleus as well as organelles, first evolved about 2.1 billion years ago. And multicellular eukaryotes first evolved at least 1.2 billion years ago. All the major phyla of animals evolved by the end of the Cambrian explosion. And by explosion here, we're not talking about some um, catastrophic event, like an actual explosion. Explosion in this context just refers to a rapid diversification of species. So it was an explosion of life or an adaptive radiation. The Cambrian explosion began about 540 million years ago and lasted about 10 million years. And plants and fungi first colonized land about 500 million years ago and were followed by amphibians that evolved from fish. If we were to use a clock analogy to tick down all the major events in the history of life on Earth, this is what it would look like. Um, as you can see, our own little bar here that represents humans is basically equivalent to the blink of an eye in this clock analogy. So here we have um, zero, which represents present day, and then billions of years ago. So the origin of the solar system and the Earth was here, um, about 4.6 billion years ago. We have prokaryotes arising. Um, we have atmospheric oxygen arising here, single-celled eukaryotes arising here and then multicellular eukaryotes arising here. So it wasn't until this point in time here, um, less than a billion years ago, that animals actually evolved. And then it's more recent still that animals were able to colonize land. All life today arises by the reproduction of pre-existing life. This term is called biogenesis. But if this is true, how could the first organisms arrive? Or arise, rather. 
From the time of the ancient Greeks until well into the 1800s, it was commonly believed that life regularly arises from non-living matter, an idea called spontaneous generation. And an example of this line of thinking is people used to think that flies were spontaneously generated from rotting meat. So it wasn't as if rotting meat attracted the flies um, and the flies laid their eggs on that meat and that um, gave rise to more flies. They truly believed that rotting meat caused flies to spontaneously generate. Today, most biologists think it is possible that life on Earth evolved from simple cells that were produced by chemical and physical processes. This is a depiction of what the Earth would have looked like about 3 billion years ago. So the atmosphere was a lot different, and it was a much more hostile and volatile environment back then. But these sort of conditions have been simulated in the lab, and um, scientists have been able to observe organic compounds forming from inorganic compounds. One of the best hypotheses that has been proposed for the origin of life on Earth is this four-stage hypothesis. So according to this hypothesis, the first organisms were products of chemical evolution in four stages. The first stage in the origin of life was the first to be extensively studied in the laboratory. So the first stage that they're talking about here is the abiotic synthesis of organic monomers. So taking inorganic ingredients and making organic monomers from those ingredients. So to answer this question, can biological monomers form spontaneously? A team of scientists made the observation that modern biological macromolecules, such as carbohydrates and proteins, are all composed of elements that were present in abundance on early Earth. The question that they proposed was, could biological molecules arise spontaneously under conditions like those on early Earth? Their hypothesis was that a closed system designed to simulate early Earth conditions could produce biologically important organic molecules from inorganic ingredients. And their prediction was that organic molecules would form and accumulate in this closed system. Their experiment involved an apparatus that they built to mimic the early Earth atmosphere and it included hydrogen gas, methane, ammonia, and water vapor. Sparks were discharged into the chamber to mimic the prevalent lightning of the early Earth atmosphere, and a condenser that cooled the atmosphere was also added, causing water and dissolved compounds to rain into the miniature sea. So this is what that apparatus looked like. We had this chamber mimicking a sea here, um, the flame would represent heating caused by um, volcanic eruptions and other activity below the crust of the earth. So we have boiling water here. Water vapor would collect in this atmosphere that also had um, other types of gases in it. And the electrode would be discharging the spark to mimic lightning. This is the condenser through which cold water was added. And then um, you have the cooled water coming through here, which was found to actually contain organic molecules that were formed from these inorganic or abiotic ingredients. So this water with um, organic compounds would drip down into this flask here and then they would analyze that for what chemicals it contained. The results were that after the apparatus had run for a week, an abundance of organic molecules essential for life had collected in the sea, including amino acids, which are the monomers of proteins. These lab experiments have been repeated and extended by other scientists. Again, repeatability is a huge factor for um, 
doing correct science and following the scientific method. If you do not sufficiently describe your methods and how you set up your experiments, then they are not repeatable and other scientists cannot verify your results. And the results support the idea that organic molecules could have arisen abiotically on early Earth. Okay, stage two of this four-stage hypothesis would be the abiotic synthesis of polymers. And researchers have brought about the polymerization of monomers to form polymers, such as proteins and nucleic acids, by dripping solutions of organic monomers onto hot sand, clay, or rock. Stage three in this four-stage hypothesis would be the formation of pre-cells. So units that resemble cells but are not as complex. These would be known as pre-cells. And a key step in the origin of life was the isolation of a collection of abiotically created molecules within a membrane, which would of course mimic what a cell is. So laboratory experiments demonstrate that pre-cells could have formed spontaneously from abiotically produced organic compounds. Such pre-cells produced in the laboratory display some lifelike properties. For example, they have a selectively permeable surface, they can grow by absorbing molecules from their surroundings, and they swell or shrink when placed in solutions of different salt concentrations. In other words, they display tonicity, um, which I covered when I was um, talking about transport in and out of cells and how cells maintain um, their internal environment separate from extracellular um, solutions. Stage four in this four-stage hypothesis would be the origin of self-replicating molecules. So if you have simple cell-like units called pre-cells, that's great, but if they can't incorporate self-replicating molecules, then how, how could life possibly arise? So life is defined partly by the process of inheritance, which is based on self-replicating molecules. One hypothesis is that the first genes were short strands of RNA that replicated themselves without the assistance of proteins and perhaps using RNAs that can act as enzymes called ribozymes. Here we have a visual representation of this process. We have RNA monomers. So they have um, two parts with a nitrogenous base. We have the formation of short RNA polymers, which would be these RNA monomers assembling together. And these would make up simple genes. The assembly of a complementary RNA chain, so just as base pairing occurs in modern day DNA and RNA through the process of transcription, um, this would be a process that also occurred with these early RNA genes. And then we would have the complementary chain serving as a template of the original gene. Over millions of years, natural selection favored the most efficient pre-cells, just as it does with actual cells. Through this process, the first prokaryotic cells evolved, and prokaryotes lived and evolved all alone on Earth for about two billion years. Prokaryotes are still very abundant and very diverse. They are everywhere. They're found wherever there is life, they have a collective biomass that is at least 10 times that of all eukaryotes. So despite the fact that they're on average much smaller than eukaryotic cells, if you were to somehow miraculously gather all of the prokaryotic cells on Earth and weigh them, their biomass would be at least 10 times that of all the eukaryotic cells. They thrive in habitats that are too cold, too hot, too salty, too acidic, or too alkaline for any eukaryotic cell. They cause about half of all human diseases, but they're most commonly benign or beneficial. 
Okay, I'm going to go ahead and pause here and I'll pick up in the next recording.